Well, we're going to dive into another Sabbath school lesson on the book of Psalms this week. We are on lesson number 10. Fascinating lesson this week. It's entitled Lessons of the Past. When I read that title, it reminded me of a statement that I heard once that went like this. If we fail to learn from the past, we are doomed to repeat it. Let me say that again. If we fail to learn from the past, we're doomed to repeat it. So in our lesson this week, we will look at the past history of Israel as this history is outlined in the Psalms. We will see at times the Lord's faithfulness at the time of Israel's rebellion. We'll learn something about God and his graciousness and how he puts up with our mistakes. We'll see at times that Israel praised the Lord and which is so thankful for his blessings. We'll see other times of God's supremacy in history and how the Lord just was so supreme throughout the history and background of Israel. So let's just jump right into our lesson. Uh, Psalm 78, verse 3 and 4. Let's take a look at that. It's our memory text, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he's done. What do you think of when you, when you hear that text? One of the things that I think of is that I want to talk to my own children about God's strength, about the wonderful way he's worked in our, my life. Not only was Israel to tell their children, but their children were to tell their children, and their children were to tell their children, right down to our generation. Um, the first paragraph here points out really the theme of the whole lesson. In numerous psalms, praise takes the form of narrating the Lord's mighty acts of salvation. In other words, many of the psalms will look back at the history of Israel and see how God worked miraculously. And uh, these psalms are often called salvation history psalms or historical psalms. Some appeal to God's people, telling them to learn from their past history particularly from their mistakes and the mistakes of their ancestors. So that's some Psalms. They really look back and they appeal to Israel to learn from their mistakes. Certain historical Psalms contain the predominant hymnal note that highlights God's past wonderful deeds on behalf of God's people, strengthens their trust in the Lord, who's able and faithful to deliver them from their present hardships. In other words, some Psalms look back and you see the wonders of God, the grace of God. You see the magnificent works of God, and it leads you to praise God and trust his strength more. In Sunday's lesson, we look at God's unstoppable faithfulness. When I read Psalm 78, Psalm 78 can be a little bit discouraging. And you say, why? Because in Psalm 78 we find a very long psalm, 72 verses. And um, you find that God's people, Israel, rebelled against him. Um, you find that he, he the, the psalm begins with, give ear, O my people, to my law. But you go through the psalm and it talks about the fact that um, Israel at times turned back and uh, they grieved God. Uh, verse 40, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yet, yet again and again, they tempted God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Can we limit the illimitable God? We can. They limited the Holy One of Israel. What did they limit? How did they limit him? Their unfaithfulness, their lack of faith, their unbelief limited what God wanted to do for them. He wanted to bring them into the promised land in just a few short days couple weeks. But yet, they wandered in the wilderness 40 years. Why? Because they limited God. Now, it says they grieved him. They provoked him. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. But you go through this whole psalm, and what do you find? It says, he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So, Israel was unfaithful, God was faithful. Israel drifted from God, God did not drift from them. They rebelled against him, 
but he reached out to them in kindness, in love, in compassion. Um, notice the last paragraph. Before we get too judgmental about Israel of past generations, we should consider ourselves. Don't we forget God's past wonders? Are we neglectful at times of his covenantal requirements? The psalm does not encourage people to reply and rely on their own deeds. Instead, Psalm 78 shows the futility of human will unless it is grounded in the constant awareness of God's faithfulness and acceptance of his grace. The unsuccessful battles of God's people, that's in Psalm 78, you know, verse 9, Psalm 78, verse 62 to 64, elucidate the psalm's lesson that human efforts, apart from God's faithfulness, are doomed to end in failure. So all of our human efforts are human efforts to live the Christian life, our human efforts to overcome temptation, our human efforts to resist Satan's attacks. All of those are doomed to failure if we are not dependent on God. But in all of that, in all of Israel's mistakes, in all of Israel's rebellion, in all of Israel's turning from him, God was faithful to them, constantly reaching out in love, in grace, in mercy. One of the, so the first lesson we learn is the futility of human strength to face the enemy without a constant awareness of God's faithfulness. The first lesson we learn, that God is faithful. At times we are not faithful. In Monday's lesson, it's a more cheerful scene. Israel looks back in Psalm 105 and uh, remembers their history, praises God. Let's look at Psalm 105. The eternal faithfulness of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Verse 1, Psalm 105. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among his peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of his wondrous works. There's an old saying that says this. Impression without expression leads to depression. Impression without expression leads to depression. In other words, express what God has done for you. Your faith will grow. Our faith grows as we express faith, as we talk about God's wondrous works, as we talk about what he's done in our own personal lives. Our faith grows. So the psalmist says, talk of his wonderful works. Verse 5, remember his par marvelous works which he has done. Remember his marvelous works. And then it tells the story of, of Israel, but it goes down specifically to Joseph. And it talks about Joseph sold as a slave and Joseph's feet in fetters, laid in irons. And he says, the Lord allowed that trial to test him. So when trials come, they are given, allowed by God to test us. And as we hang on by faith, as we do not exhibit unbelief, as we do not complain, as we do not uh, rebel against God in the trial, but as we are faithful to God in that particular trial, our faith grows. We, and Ellen White makes an interesting statement. She says, if you want faith, talk faith. So we talk of God's wondrous works. We praise God even in trial. And God takes us through those trials. Here is a formula to get you through trials and to see the miracles of God. And I'll put it in a mathematical formula. Praise plus faith, praise plus faith plus prayer equals a miracle. When I pray and I praise and I trust, I can put it this way, reverse the formula a little bit. Prayer plus praise plus faith or trust equals a miracle. You want to see a miracle in your life? Talk of God's wondrous works. Talk faith and you'll have faith. When you go through a trial, pray, praise, and trust, and you watch the miracles that God's works. Second paragraph, Psalm 105 resembles Psalm 78 that we did yesterday in highlighting God's faithfulness to his people in history. And it does so in order to glorify God and to inspire faithfulness. Psalm 105 shows that in order to truly Praise God. God's people need to know the facts of their history. History provides both validation for our faith and countless reasons for praising God. You know, I just want to pause there. 
uh, in my life this year, I've decided to study Adventist history a little bit more. And so I was looking back at the history of the movement of the Advent movement. I read a biography of James White, biography of Joseph Bates, reading a biography of J.N. Andrews, read a biography of uh, John Harvey Kellogg, and uh, I, am, I finished to tell the world. And one of the things that I've learned as I've read, I've seen the conflicts that have taken place in early Adventist history. I've seen the challenges that have taken place. I've seen the trials that have taken place. But I've seen the hand of God in guiding this church. I've seen God's intervention at times of trial and difficulty. I've seen the miracle working power of God in raising up this body of believers who have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. And studying Adventist history has confirmed my belief. It's, it's maybe made it really stronger. It is intensified and deep in my belief that the Seventh Adventist Church is a divine movement of destiny raised up by God to prepare a world for his soon coming. When you remember history and you look back on what God has done, it strengthens your faith. Tuesday, remembering history and repentance. Uh, Psalm 106. In Psalm 106, we find that... Um, Israel comes to the point of looking at the past, looking at their history, looking at their current faults, and seeking God and praying, asking God for forgiveness. Psalm 106, uh, you go down through it, it talks about the Red Sea experience, the deliverance of Israel at the Red Sea, but then in verse 13 it says, they soon forgot his works, they did not wait for his counsel, they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness, and tested God in the desert, and he gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul. You remember they, they, were, they wanted the flesh pots of Egypt, and God gave them quail to eat, but as they get that quail, they got sick, and they vomited it up, so they didn't remember his mercies. They forgot his benefits. They murmured, they complained, and uh, yet, yet, you go down through the psalm, and it says, Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction. When he heard their cry, and for the sake, he re for their sake he remembered his covenant, relented according to the multitude of his mercies. That's the 45th verse. He also made them to be pitied by all those who carried them away captive. Save us, O Lord. Gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your name, so to triumph in your cause. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. What do we see in Psalm 106? We see in this psalm the fact that Israel, looking back on their history and their present experience, looking back at the Exodus experience, remember, they remember their failures. And remembering those failures, they ask God for forgiveness. I want you to think back over your life. I want you to think back over your marriage. Have there been times that you have failed and you've been unkind? Think back of your child raising. Have there been times that you have made serious mistakes? Think back in your work. Think back over your life. As we look back over the past, we don't wallow in our mistakes. We don't immerse ourselves in guilt, but we say, God, forgive us. And when we ask God to forgive us for the mistakes of the past, it frees us to live holy, righteous, godly lives in the present. Um, second paragraph down, the Psalm 2, as the others, points to God's faithfulness to his covenant of grace by which he saved his people in the past. It expresses hope that God will again show favor to his repentant people and gather them from among the nations. The plea for present deliverance is not some wishful thinking, but a prayer of faith based on the assurance of God's past deliverances. You find that in Psalm 106, verse 1 to 3, and the unfailing character of God's faithfulness to his covenant with his people. So what we find is that God didn't cast off his people. He didn't cast them off. He won't cast you off, my friend. Wednesday's lesson is a fascinating one. It's about the parable of the vine. 
And I find three interesting words in that parable. It talks about God planting a vineyard. and It talks about uh, the uh, weeds that come into the vineyard and so forth. But there are three interesting words in it. It talks about how God planted the vineyard, how he had great hopes for it, uh, and uh, how he prays that um, the vineyard will be restored. Psalm 80, uh, you'll find that there. Um, but here it says, uh, give here, O good shepherd, you, sh you who lead Israel like a flock. That's Psalm 80, verse 1. You dwell between the cherubim, shine forth, restore us, verse 3, cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. And then, then uh, he, he portrays his people as this vine that he expects to bear delightful fruit. But then he uses three words. Verse 7, restore us, O God of hosts. That's the first R. Verse 14, return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. And that's verse 14. Verse 18, then we will t not turn our back from you. Revive us. Did you get the key three key words there? Restore, return, revive. When we recognize like in the parable of this vine that did not produce the fruit that God desired, when we recognize that we haven't been producing the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., when in our lives, remember John 15 talks about uh, they'll bear much fruit if we are grafted into the vine and the life of the vine, the life of Christ flows into us. But we recognize at times we may not have borne much fruit, we say, God, restore us. What does restore us mean? It means to take us back to a relationship with God so that life from him flows into us, restore us, then return. Lord, we want to return. To be restored, we have to first return. Return to what? Return to a relationship with God in prayer, in Bible study, in witness. And then revive. What is revival? It's the quickening of spiritual life in the soul. It is the new life that Christ has to offer us. Here are the three key words in Psalm 80. Don't miss them when you study your Sabbath school lesson. Restore me, O oh God. Restore me. Restore me so that I can live and dwell in your presence. Verse 7. Lord, I want to return return to a meaningful relationship with you, verse 14, and Lord, revive me. Make me new again. Revive me. May the spiritual life be requickened in my soul. And you remember in Psalm 80, Israel longs to be blessed by God. It kind of reminds you, doesn't it, of num number 6, 22 to 27, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And the Lord give you peace. This week's lesson focuses at the end in Thursday. It kind of sums everything up. And that's the Lord's supremacy in history. Um, you see, when Israel is unfaithful, God is still supreme. When Israel praises God, they acknowledge his supremacy. Even when we find that uh, Israel needs to repent, they look to the supreme God who will restore them, who will cause them to return to him, who will revive them. And Psalm 135 is a psalm focusing on the supremacy of God, uh, how supreme he is in every aspect of life. So no matter what's going on in your life, God indeed is supreme. Psalm 135. We're going to look at the, and it says, praised, he, how, how is his supremacy revealed? Praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Verse 1, praise him, O your servants, you who stand in the house of the Lord and the courts of our God. We, and what, why, why is he supreme? Verse 5, for I know that the Lord is great, our God, the Lord is above all gods. Why? Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in the heaven and the earth and the seas and the deep places. 
He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings up the wind out in his treasures. So he, he's supreme. Why is he supreme? Because he's the creator. He created heaven. He created earth. He created the sun, moon, and stars. He spoke and the world came into existence. His word is powerful. He's creator. He's supreme. What is the evidence of his supremacy? He brought Israel out of Egypt. He miraculously sent the plagues, broke the bond of the Egyptians, opened the Red Sea so Israel could, could walk through. He, he crushed the nations. So it says here, Psalm 135, he's stronger than the idols. They have mouths, verse 16, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. There's no breath in their mouth. He blessed the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of, e of Levi. Why? You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. What's the theme here? God is supreme. Second paragraph, let me read it for you under Thursday's lesson. The Lord demonstrated his grace by choosing the people of Israel as his special treasure. Special treasure conveys the distinctive covenantal relationship between the Lord and his people. The choosing of Israel was based on the Lord's sovereign will, and thus Israel has no ground to feel superior over other peoples. This demonstrates that the Lord's sovereign purposes for the world did not begin with Israel, but with the creation. Therefore, Israel should humbly fulfill its assigned role in God's salvation purposes for the entire world. God chose Israel. God himself led Israel. God himself revealed his sovereign power for Israel. So it was nothing for them to boast in. And likewise, God has raised up a special treasure for himself, a special people called the remnant in these last days. There's nothing to boast about. We've been chosen by God, formed by God, created by God. God has raised up an end time people to share his love, his grace, and his glory for the ends of the earth. On Friday's lesson, there is a paragraph right at the end that says the history of God's people demonstrates that no promise that God has made in his word will be left unfulfilled. This includes both divine promises of present, present individual care and future promises of Christ's second coming, which will establish God's kingdom of justice and peace on the new earth. The, the key takeaway from this lesson is that God is sovereign. He raised up Israel to accomplish a purpose. He was faithful to them, even if they didn't accomplish that purpose. But he will have an end-time people, and he promises that his purposes will be accomplished through them, the earth will be lightened with the glory of God, Revelation 18, verse 1. The gospel got every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, Revelation 14, verse 6. This gospel of the kingdom shall go to all the world, then the end shall come, Matthew 24, verse 14. The earth will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of God, Habakkuk 2, 14. This is nothing for us to boast in. The church at times has failed. Leaders at times have made mistakes. But like with Israel, God is gracious, God is merciful, and through this people, this end time last day people, God is going to accomplish his purposes. God will demonstrate that he is supreme. I thank God that we can be part of a movement destined for glory. We can be part of a movement raised up by God to accomplish his purposes, to fulfill his will, to illuminate this earth with his glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we look back at Israel and we know that if we don't consider all these past things, we are condemned to repeat them. We thank you that you were faithful at times when Israel was unfaithful. We thankful that you revealed your supreme will, even at a time when Israel rebelled, we're thankful that you were still guiding your people. And Father, as we think of the church today, we think of the fact that there have been mistakes. 
We think of the fact that there's worldliness. We think of the fact that there's Laodicean complacency. But you will not give up on your people. You will bring restoration, revival. Your people will return to you. There'll be a mighty movement. The earth will be filled with your glory. The gospel will be preached to the end of the earth, and Jesus will come. And for that, we thank you. Help us look deep within our own hearts to be faithful to you always in Christ's name. Amen.